Hi, I'm Chris Bishop and a very warm welcome to the Entrepreneurial Edge. Now making money and marketing through the digital world is a dream for many and the preserve of the hard working and successful few. This week we have one man who is doing just this. Rob Stokes, the owner of Quirk, a digital agency with offices in Cape Town, Johannesburg and London that has recently doubled, trebled its staff to 300 and won a few awards along the way. All of this from a business that was born, like so many on this program, in the back bedroom, where Rob Stokes now was in, then in his third year of studying business science at UCT in Cape Town. How did the entrepreneurial edge turn this humble beginning into a multi-million dollar concern? We have the man himself in the studio with us, so just tell us in a nutshell before we start, what exactly your business does? So the core of our business, Chris, is, a, is an agency. Um, we're very digitally focused, although we're certainly branching beyond that, um, as, as one needs to do in this day and age. It's probably about 18, 90% of our revenue. It's where we began. It's been, uh, it's been our focus for the last 13, 14 years, and, and still very much is. But I think as, the, it, as is the nature of the entrepreneur, we've branched out a bit beyond that. I'm personally quite passionate with uh, software businesses and, and their ability to, to achieve global revenues from a local base. And um, so we're trying to diversify as best we can while still sticking within the technology and marketing fields. Now you said uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. Now you're the son of an entrepreneur as well, your father was. So just tell us what sort of socialization, as they say these days, when you were growing up, what you saw from your father. So my, my dad is, is your quintessential traditional entrepreneur. He ran a, a petrol station, a towing business, a scrapyard, tow bars, mechanics, trailers, the whole bang shoot. And I guess I grew up We'd have dinner together every night, no, no TV dinners in our household, and um, my mum was his, was his bookkeeper, and thank goodness for it, um, <laughs> and they'd sit and talk business, and, and, and I was very excited by this, and, and I listened to what they had to say, and I think as a result, I, I almost had no choice but to be an entrepreneur. When I was at school, I accounted recently that I had 17 different businesses by the time I finished matric, none of them successful, and all of them banned. Mm. Um, but it, it's kind of just in my blood. It's what I enjoy doing. I, I consider myself fairly, fairly unemployable. What sort of uh, stuff were you doing when you were at school? I, I think I, I, sold, uh, I sold comic books. I remember the school said you can't sell comic books. The next day I was renting them. Um, I sold fudge. I uh, had a small ice pop cartel in grade one. Um, really anything I could buy and sell, get my hands on pizzas. Um, actually, that was a pretty successful business as I used to buy pizzas from the spa down the road and sell them at break. Um, and I was, it, for me, it was more the act and, and the process of business rather than the, the financial reward. And I think I'm still like that today. And during that time when you were growing up, what, was your, what did your father used to say to you that sort of made you think? So I think we were quite different coming from different eras. He's, he's very mechanical. Um, always knows how to suss out a good deal and whereas I'm you know kind of the call it the, the technology computer generation so we couldn't necessarily relate on that playing field but certainly I think in terms of of negotiation um, in in terms of you know the often the opportunity for an entrepreneur is, is when you buy not when you sell and I think those kind of lessons is what I what I picked up from him and I think it was just very inspiring to have someone who came from very humble roots um, you know kind of kicked off with nothing and worked really really hard and and built himself up uh, yeah, from the bottom and I've, I've always been quite inspired by that. But you yourself, I mean you went off to, to business studies or business science at the uh, University of Cape Town. Um, you could have quite easily got quite a nice paying job and been quite comfortable, less headaches. So why, why didn't you do that? I just, yeah, I, I could never see myself being employed. I think I'd be a terrible employee. Um, I tend to be uh, quite a master of my own destiny. I like to do things on my own terms. I, I make my own hours. They're generally quite crazy hours, but I can't work within a rigid structure. I don't like rules. Um, and so I, I almost didn't have a choice. In fact, my, my last job was a waitering job, and I quit it six, six weeks before I started Quirk. And I vowed I would never work for anyone else again. I was too frustrated by poor restaurant management. Really? So how bad was it for you? It was really bad. I could tell you some horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but then um, what gave you the, the big idea? People always ask that question. 
Look, I, I'd love to be able to say I started with a grand vision, but the reality was I started with a need to make some money because um, I'd stopped my waitering job. I was very inspired, I think, by two people. Um, globally, a, a chap called Michael Dell, Dell Computers, who started his business from his dorm room, cut his door in half so he could sell computers over the door. And then uh, it, when I was studying at UCT, Mark Shuttleworth came in and gave us a lecture. And he was just amazingly inspiring, super humble guy, and I mean, he put it all down to luck. But if you, if you know him, you'll know that he's actually an incredibly talented individual. But I sat there in the lecture hall at UCT and I thought, if he can do it, so can I. I was wrong, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I just felt I, it was kind of the path I had to choose. I didn't really know what I wanted to be doing. I just knew I wanted to start a business. And, um, you yeah, know, one night I, I said to myself, I need to make some money. I'm not going to go and deliver more pizzas or waiter again. And, and here we are today. And it, it took a good few years for us to really figure out what it is we wanted to be. In the beginning, it was just do whatever it takes to make some cash. So how humble were these beginnings? It was in your back bedroom. Just paint it was in my picture. bedroom. There, was, there your, wasn't a no back bedroom. bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was just your bedroom. So just paint us a picture then. I mean, how you, that first day you switched on your computer. Tell us what it was. So the, yeah, the first thing I did was buy a computer. Um, right. At school, uh, one of my talents uh, was, one of my few talents, I wasn't a very good student, um, was actually in the, in the inter-school stock exchange game mm. and in one of my businesses I made a little bit of money and I put it in the stock exchange and um, and I had uh, I think probably about 10,000 Rand and I used that to to buy a computer and um, to buy my first piece of stock which was a computer which I subsequently sold to a very good friend of mine uh, it broke down six weeks later and I wasn't too clued up on how to fix it and therein lay my first business partner um, but you know, in the first couple of years, we we would sell hardware. We would build terrible websites. I remember crawling around on my hands and knees in in a in the uh, office of a of a Ronda Bosch estate agent, networking up his office, not really knowing what I was doing. Thank goodness Google had you know kind of just got going then. So every time a client would present a challenge, I'd head off to the search engine to figure out how to solve it. Um, and it really, until I left university, which was two years into the business. We were just scrapping, uh, just trying to make some pocket money. Uh, and then when I left university, uh, I guess there was a realization that now I had to really stand on my own two feet. And the option was go and get a job. And you know, for business science students, I guess, even though I wasn't necessarily the greatest student, uh, that wasn't going to be too difficult. But I was absolutely determined not to go down that road. And there were times when I regretted that because I was extremely poor, extremely poor. <laughs> I once ate nothing but carrots for two weeks. That's a true story. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but carrots. <laughs> I mean, I'm orange enough already, so <laughs> <laughs> it got worse. But I, I'm, really, I'm really happy that I, I stayed the course. <laughs> that's something you can tell your grandchildren when, yeah. they're, when they're complaining. You say, I ate carrots for two weeks. I'm sorry they're about that. They're really cheap and nutritious. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was very healthy for you too. But uh, OK, um, so just take us back as well to when you first started in this digital game, to the very beginnings of the internet in, this, in, you know, in Africa. I mean, we all take it for granted now. But uh, how sort of uh, basic was it when you started? So I think once again, you know, if you look at, if you look, for example, Malcolm Glad Gladwell's book Outliers, he talks about the timing of when people are born, and it's it's amazing the, the coincidences or or not. Um, and I think in, in many respects, I'm actually about two or three years too old. But I think I was very lucky in that I had a mother who, I wouldn't say she loved technology, but she loved efficiency. And so I think in the late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember exactly when, before the internet came to South Africa, she was using something called Belltel uh, to do online banking because it was mm. more efficient than going into a bank. And off the back of that, it meant we had a modem in the house. So I started tinkering with that and I, I ran a bulletin board uh, for my friends so we could uh, share games with each other. Um, and I guess I, I I kind of jumped the gun in terms of technology. We were fortunate to have a computer at home with a black, uh, orange and black screen. I'll never forget that. <laughs> um, and it just meant that I was very technology curious. I've always loved gadgets. I went through quite a phase in the late 90s where I loved gaming. Um, I must say I sadly don't do much of it anymore. But I think, for example, my reason for getting a computer initially wasn't for work. It was to play games. Um, and so I was very focused on the hardware and the specs and what have you. And it forced me to become quite, uh, quite technically literate. And I think that allowed me to be kind of slightly ahead of my peers, which 
in many respects then allowed me to offer a service around it because I, I certainly wouldn't class myself as, as extremely technical and, and I'm very fortunate to have business partners who complement those weaknesses but uh, back in those early days I maybe knew a little bit more than my average client and therefore they were prepared to pay something for me to help them. Because that was one of the problems, I mean the pioneer uh, Ronnie Aptek has said on this very program, he said that when he first started selling uh, internet solutions, they said, well, uh, people saying, what is the internet? And then they didn't know, he had to try and explain it to them. And he said, they phoned him up and say, oh, uh, my internet's broken. And they said, well, it can't be. Uh, and then another time they'd say, who do I email? And he'd say, oh, well, you can email me. <laughs> no, I, had, I, had, sort of I had similar stories. I, I, would, I remember in about 2001, 2002, we really figured out how to get a site to the top of Google. Now, in, in 2012, that's an absolute business necessity. If people can't find you on a search engine, you're not going to go very far. But I remember visiting some of South Africa's largest corporates and saying, you know, we can help you do this. And we had some proven uh, case studies. And the, the general response would be, why is this important? Why do I need to be at the top of Google? We'd never get that response today. Now it's a case of, I need to be there. Which service provider is best equipped to help me do it? So it was very, very difficult. And you know, sometimes people talk about being ahead of the game, and I think we were, and I think that was actually a disadvantage. I don't. I think if I if I knew then what I know now around business and, and the critical element of timing in business success, I would have done things quite differently. We were certainly at, at one point kind of five years ahead of where we needed to be, um, which sounds great, but it actually made life quite difficult. And your uh, your first proper sale when it wasn't just pocket money, when you were a fully fledged business. Do you remember that day? I do, actually. It was quite a, it was quite a story. Um, we were on the verge of bankruptcy. We had had a meeting with, with the three partners at the time on a Saturday um, around a bowl of carrots. And um, it was a case of we've got a week to bring in some money or we're closing doors. And I was very fortunate in that um, a business called Kido, they make kids clothing, called me up I think on the Thursday late afternoon, you know, nails were short by then, <laughs> and said we want you to build our website. And um, you know, in, in, in today's context it wasn't, a, it wasn't a big piece of business, but back then it was, it was amazing for us. I mean it was literally changed the business, kept us afloat for another six months, helped us, because I think we did a great job, helped us build a, a great case study on, on how to build a business for a fairly big company, how to build a website for a very really big company, and that allowed us to pick up some momentum. And I think for me, that was kind of the end of the dark days and the really challenging times. It certainly didn't get easy for at least another two or three years, till kind of 2004, 2005. But uh, that was a lifesaver, and I will always have massive respect <laughs> for that business. Um, and I remain uh, good friends with the owner of that business to this day. And I, I'm not sure he even realizes how he pulled us out of the mire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking about your business and the wide industry and holding the second half. Hold that thought there. It's time for a short ad break now. We'll see you right after this. <laughs> 